just to, to start before we jump into the, the formal agenda, um, Helene, do you want to take a few moments just to say hi, hello, and tell us a little bit about yourselves, and then we can each kind of say our, our introductions too. Um, sure. So my name is Helene Busby. Um, I've lived in Holyoke now for a little over three years um, prior to uh, to to coming to Holyoke, I lived in New York City for many years, which is where my husband is from. We lived in Queens, very close to where he grew up. Um, but I'm originally actually from the North Shore, so I'm I'm back in Massachusetts, where I grew up and where my parents live. Um, so where my son's grandparents live. Um, I am uh, I'm a attorney at a local nonprofit. And my focus is on providing free legal services to families um, who need help with education issues, mostly special education, but also discipline issues and supporting families um, in getting child disability called SSI payments uh, for families. So that's, that's kind of what I do as my day job. Love it. Thank you for telling us a little bit about you. And uh, How did you get um, involved in the Parks and Recs Commission? I applied. <laughs> I have a now seven-year-old, um, and so we're we're huge fans of the park, and we go up to um, we live near community field, and so I'm probably there every day um, uh, or hiking around, and just wanting to kind of support um, uh, families and opportunities for kids um, in a way that's a little different from my my actual work. Um, it seemed like a good opportunity. Uh, hi, Izzy. I got to meet you through that, uh, which has been great. So, Yes, and we're welcoming Israel Rivera back on CPC, but in a new role, um, because Israel is now coming on as the representative from City Council. So congratulations to City Councilor Rivera. Um, and we are glad to see you continue with us. So I was very excited to hear about that. Oh, I'm, I'm here. Um, I'm driving to City Hall right now, so I don't want to be on the screen, but I'm here and I hear everybody. Helene, it's awesome to see you. <laughs> and it's awesome to be here and I, I'm serving in this role too. And I know, Israel, you will likely be leaving us at 630 because you have ordinance, right? You are correct, okay. Madam Chair, Chairwoman. There we go. Okay, so I am Meg McGrath-Smith. Um, I'm the CPC chair. This is my first year in that role. Um, and I've been on the CPC for three years. And um, my day job is I'm an instructional leader for Springfield Public Schools. So also that connection, right, between families and doing good in the world. And a lot of the work I do is around uh, literacy work, right? So maybe that's intervention for writing or reading or making sure kids are getting accelerated so they can sign up for AP or they'll be ready for their SATs, right? I do a lot of that work. I'm in a six through 12 school. So I get all the littles who are shorter than me when I start <laughs> with them in sixth grade. And then by the time, well, I was going to say by the time they're seniors, they're towering over me, but that's a lie. It's like the end of sixth grade. <laughs> There'll be like three of them who are no longer totally shorter than I am. <laughs> that's okay. Um, I, I, what I lack in height, I make up in will. <laughs> well, uh, welcome everybody. Um, let's just each briefly say a little bit about ourselves. Yeah, you know, it's just a hi, hello, and then who you represent, um, just so everybody can know um, who everybody is. You know, we're gonna keep doing this probably a little bit because our composition is changing, right, um, over the course of this year. So it's important for us to get to know each other even though we're on Zoom. And it's hard to have those little informal connections that would help us know who each other is um, easily, right? On Zoom, you have to sort of formalize it and call on people. <laughs> um, so Michael, would you mind going next? Um, Mike Falsetti, I'm representing the Hoyle Housing Authority as its representative. Uh, I've also been on here for three years. Um, lifelong resident of Hoyoke, born and brought up and um, uh, retired and enjoy working with everybody. And we had a very productive three years um, and uh, looking forward to our next uh, year uh, and the challenges and responsibilities we have. Uh, we do good work uh, and um, welcome folks. Um, 
Michael's also the vice chair. And I'm the vice chair. Forgot that. Um, John, would you mind sharing? Sure. Good evening. I'm uh, John Kelly, and I'm uh, representing the planning board. I'm chairman of the planning board. I've been on the planning board about 20 years. Third generation, long, lifelong Hoyt resident. Um, retired over 44 years in banking and financial services and other things too. And uh, just kind of, uh, this is actually my second meeting, so I'm still kind of a newbie uh, to this board, but kind of familiar with your work. And uh, uh, looking toward a good, good tenure. Marco? Um, hi, I'm Marco Crescentini. I, I'm here representing the Holyoke Historical Commission. Um, I, I've been on this commission for three years since its inception. I, I'm an architect. I've lived in Holyoke now for about seven years, a little over seven years. And uh, yeah, I, I've, I've enjoyed being a part of this commission. And Marco knows all about Parks and Rec because he has many children who are involved in everything. <laughs> Um, yeah, some of the local parks, maybe. Yeah, I, I live on Fairfield Avenue, so the um, yeah, there are a couple that are close to me. Mary, I'm Mary Moyarty. I'm on the I'm the representative from the Conservation Commission, and um, I'm a lifelong resident of Holyoke and retired. And I'm the minutes taker. <laughs> Secretary, uh, uh, Maribel. Oh, oh, you're, you're muted. muted. Oh, thank you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Maribel Ortiz. I work for the Holyoke Health Center. I work for a pediatric residency program from NYU. I've been working there for 10 years. and I've been living here in Holyoke for the last 20 years. Um, and this is my second meeting with you guys. <laughs> Well, welcome. We're happy to have you. And as a, a short update on that, I did uh, speak with um, Peter Tallman, who is now the chair of public service. And he said that um, they would be scheduling the kind of moving forward with making appointments official for CPC over the next few weeks. So that's exciting that there's some the movement on getting that done. All right. Um, and then Amy, do you want to uh, talk about your role? Yeah, so um, I've, I'm the CPC staff person, so I'm an employee for, for the city of Holyoke, and I've been with the, um, working for the committee for the last over three years, actually. Um, and yeah, so I'm kind of, um, you know, looking at all the applications and kind of doing all the administrative type of work. Um, we need a lot of research. <laughs> Yeah, lots of research, looking at what's eligible, working with a city solicitor. It's actually very involved. <laughs> it is. Very complicated. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, we're going to get started um, by our first agenda item is around looking at the minutes um, from 12-8-21, uh, December 8th, from the last meeting. Um, did anyone have a chance or did everyone have a chance to, to review the minutes? Um, and does anyone have any um, suggestions um, for shifting anything in the minutes or does everything look okay? Yes, Michael. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, I, this could be on me actually. I'm looking at the draft of the uh, minutes of December 8th. Uh, down on item three, uh, it says update on current and past uh, projects. The um, uh, third or fourth sentence down, it said, says, Jim Linfield introduced himself as a, the new representative from Wayfinders. He's taking over from Steve Huntley. I thought I, I could be, maybe it's me. I thought Steve Huntley worked for um, Valley uh, Opportunity Council. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's, you're right. You're right. It's no big deal. But, <laughs> So who did he take oh, okay, over? Okay, so that Amy? that so that should be corrected to. Um, so is he? Then. So what? Which part is wrong? Is he? Is he representing Wayfinders, Linfield? Wayfinders, yeah. Yeah. And Probably he's say, not Probably taking in, over for Huntley. In the sentence there. He, he did take over for Lidara. I forgot Lidara's yeah. last name, oh, but he took over yeah, for yes, the original yeah. Wayfinders person. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it should say Lidara. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Steve, um, Go ahead. Okay. 
The other Thank thing you. That, that I had was just how we mark who was present. So um, technically John Kelly was already the representative from the planning commission and Mimi Panich was just a, a member of the public who was joining. Oh, okay. So that should say, and what did like, you say about another person? We would just drop Mimi Panich entirely since we don't um, take a, a you know, record of who from the public attends and you would just have John Kelly there. All right, and what did you say? You said about another person that was missing from the list just now. Did you say so and so attended, or you were that was part of what you were saying? Oh yeah, I was just saying that Mimi Panich just was attending as a member oh, of the just public. Mimi. So okay. just if you drop Mimi Panich and just have John Kelly, representative from Planning Commission. And, and Mary, Mary, if you could do it, it's 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 K E L L E Y. E Y. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, and as a point of clarification, I just want to make sure it's Lidera Zara. Is that right? Uh, Z O L A Zola. So it's not Lidera. Right. Uh, and just, just oh, okay. So it's L E D A R A one one name. No, actually, it's L. I mean, because I looked it up, so I knew that it. Um, Why can you put it in the chat? Yeah, it's L E E D A R A C O L A. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Oh, thank you, Marco. Mm. Um, uh, Lazuriaga um, for Marco and Dennis Lazuriaga under also present. Um, I can find the correct spelling for you of their last name. And then Armor and Company, Armor is, is like the, the, the European spelling. It's A-R-M-O-U-R um, instead of A-A-R-M-O-R. -A Okay. Okay, anyone else have anything else? Well, the only other thing that I thought of yesterday and I could not find it on the minutes, I mean, on the video, did we set a date for the annual meeting, the public meeting that's supposed to be at the senior center? The 27th. Oh, oh, that's the meeting that will be at the tw on the 27th. Yes, although um, since then things have shifted in the city with numbers so much that it's going to be a virtual meeting um, held on okay. the 27th at six o'clock. Yes, uh, Michael. M Madam Chairman, this has got nothing to do with the, uh, you raised a point that I was gonna ask. This has got nothing to do with the, uh, the draft mm -hmm. or the acceptance of, of the minutes of the meeting. My question is, is it the mayor, th did the mayor say that uh, we cannot meet in public uh, and, and we, all meetings must be Zoom? Is, is that from City Hall? No, it's not from City Hall. I, and I, I can take a step back and, and we can come back to it under other and we can certainly discuss it as a committee if sure. we want. I, I felt like I was, I was, I was needing to make a call because they needed to decide if they if if Holyoke Media was running a hybrid meeting for us, then they had to start getting some balls running with with putting people in staffing positions and setting up physical space for us. So um, the numbers seemed to be really rising, and so that's what I was leaning into. But let's come back to it under other, and folks can just like let it permeate in your brain <laughs> over the course of the meeting. At the end, like let's come back to that. And if okay. if I got it wrong, like I'm I'm happy to move forward with a different plan. Um, but that's sort of what I was I was thinking we were going to do. But let's come back no, to we it. Can, in, in we can other wait for sure. No problem. No problem. I appreciate you, Mike. Okay, so um, do I have, with those edits, um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Um, and all in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Or raise your hand. Okay, um, Helene, are you abstaining? Um, I, I didn't hear a second. I'll second um, Michael I'll second. Felsetti had seconded. And Helene, you're abstaining. Yeah, I wasn't here, so I might as well, but I'm certainly not voting against it. <laughs> totally fine. Okay. All right, great. So we're going to move now into an update on some current and past projects. Um, so this will sort of be like a quick, like, blitz of information, and feel, pre feel free to pause me at any time um, if you have questions. Um, I'm going to bring up my Google, Google Doc so that I can see all of my notes. Okay, so um, 
With the Wayfinders Library Commons 2 project, um, you know, effectively, you know, we've heard they're feeling very positive about funding coming forward, but the announcement by the state has been delayed, um, but they have not been told to reapply in the round that's happening right now. So that is actually itself a, a, a really good indicator, um, but they can't make any official announcement until the state does, right? Um, so, um, but that's a good thing, right? Um, which means that that project will move forward. Um, and um, Kathy Degnan, the city solicitor, is working on the affordable housing restriction for that project. Um, the Chestnut Street Valley Opportunity Council project, um, there was a request to extend for one year approved by the city council. Um, we last meeting had talked about, could we just ask city council for sort of a blanket up to two years for each project? Um, but in the meantime, um, Mike Sullivan, we had talked and, uh, about the need to have an extension uh, for several projects. And on his last meeting, he was able to actually get an extension um, on the floor, which I wasn't expecting to, to be able to happen. And so I never, we didn't put forward an order for up to two years because he was able to um, have approved a six month extension um, for one project and a, a year extension for another, which when I, when we looked at the applicants, it looks like that will effectively cover their needs. So until we feel like we need to go back and ask for more, we're not going to, um, because that was already approved. So uh, the Chester Seat project got that um, one year approval by city council for an extension. Um, the preservation restriction is completed and signing um, has begun, which is exciting. Um, I think we're just waiting for one last piece, which is um, Kathy Degnan is following up with Mass Historic um, to make sure they don't need to approve it. And we've heard from them that they don't, but I think she's trying to follow up and just do her due diligence as city solicitor. Um, Armor and Co. Um, we need to vote on a one-year extension here. Their contract does allow for a one-year extension and that would meet their needs on top of what they already have for their deadline. Um, so I'm hoping that we can vote on that now um, so that we can tell them they at least have that one-year extension. Um, and the city solicitor has, uh, has written a preservation restriction uh, for that project and has started to, to meet with them um, and the Historic Commission, I think is gonna be taking it up on in a, in a coming, upcoming meeting. Marco, do you know more about that? I, I did not, I was not present at Monday's Historic Commission meeting. I, and so no, I, I missed that coordination. I know that they were gonna talk about the preservation restrictions. Okay. Okay. I apologize. But that's a good thing, I think, for the Historic Commission to take lead on looking at that with them and addressing any of their concerns about changing the scope of their work or having to submit new drawings. Like, it's a good fit for their expertise to, to make that call versus the, them running it just through us, I think. Um, Mary, you had a question? At the last meeting, Kip put in um, a motion saying that Armour and Company would be included in the uh, in the list of um, uh, applications that were going to go in for a two-year extension. Right. So what happens now with that? So we never put the two-year extension forward to city council because it looked like we didn't realize that Mike Sullivan was going to be able to get the extension that we talked about on the floor in his last meeting done, and he did. So it feels a little redundant to go back to city council a week later and say, actually, no, could we have up to two years? <laughs> um, so uh, rather than start off on that foot, I'd rather give Armour and Company the one-year extension that we're allowed to give and then work with them if they end up needing more than that. Yep. Madam Chairman, uh, pardon me for interrupting. Uh, what Mary indicated, I I'm just reading the minutes uh, and you could explain this if I'm not interpreting it correctly. Uh, a motion was made by Kip Foley to add the Armour & Company FY20 project to the list of projects for which we would be asking city council for a longer extension. Yeah. Second by Falsetti, motion passed unanimously. So the intent is for us to give him that extension. And is it your understanding that it will now be for one year? So the CPC, our body has the ability based on their contract terms to give them a one year extension. If we wanna give them more than that, we have to go to city council. No, that's okay. But I, I'm, I'm saying we've already put our intent by way of a vote. Our intent, it, it, you know, we can do it again for one year if, if you so choose. 
well, I can go to um, city council. I, I think more than anything, it felt odd to me that like one had gone through, which we didn't know was going to happen. And then we sort of voted as a committee to ask for more, but we just asked for less. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't know what we think about that. I can go back to city council and we can put in that order and say, actually, I know you just voted for six months for this project and a year for this, but could you just give us a blanket two year for all of these? Like we've already voted on that. And if folks want me to do that, happy to. Um, I just didn't know if it felt awkward um, because we didn't know that kind of interstitial step was gonna happen. Yeah, the interstitial step was gonna happen for the Chestnut Street. But so now it's also happening for Armor and Company. And also, I mean, I don't, I guess, I know we wanna move forward, but I'm not sure how that works. If you make a motion and say that you're gonna do something mm -hmm. and then you don't do it, can you just not do it? Um, can know. you just do that? I mean, I don't, I'm asking <laughs> for somebody who knows about these things, like maybe John Kelly from past history or Michael from past history. Um, I, I don't know, can you just do it? Uh, I mean, I understand what you're trying to do. You're trying to move forward. But if you've yeah, made I, I a promise yeah. that you would do something, what happens? My, my, my thought and probably suggestion would be that um, the last meeting of the council there, there's a whole new makeup of the city council now anyway. There's some yeah. new members. And we didn't know that council itself was going to make the request that he did. But I would suggest that we probably would proceed uh, with the original request that uh, Michael talked about that was voted on. You just get them all done and want to take them, you know, piecemeal through the, through the rest of the year. Just going to okay. get them all sit as we originally voted. You know, just acknowledging to the city council that Councilor Salvo, we realize and appreciate what he did. However, we had taken a vote to go for two years. We just we just asked the council to go along with a two-year extension. Be that simple. Okay. Do others I, don't know feel other, that too? I don't know other people's feelings are, but I think that might be the way to proceed and, you know, And so then was a list made? Yeah. Well, the five projects were um, War Memorial, um, the Valley Opportunity Chestnut Street Project, Armor and Company, Mayor Field, and was that Pulaski Park, CSC, I don't know if you said that one. Okay. Well, if folks want us to move forward with that, we did vote on it last time. I'm happy to. I think more than anything, it just feels a little awkward, <laughs> but that's okay. Okay. All right. Um, so um, the War Memorial was um, already given a six month extension um, by city council. Uh, we're still working to fix the award amount error that happened in the copy of the contract that was signed. Um, just as a reminder, in one place it said 55,000, in one place it said 60,000. Everyone is in, in agreement about what the award is, but it's still a mistake in the contract. And so we are crossing that off and then slowly going through everyone having to resign the, uh, the contract just by, to initial the shift. Um, Amy, is there anything else you needed to share about the War Memorial Project? I just wanted to mention, yeah, there was a, another small change that you're working on, which was that since Bob Parent is um, involved with that, he learned that um, the protective coating is not a good idea to uh, restore this type of building. Um, I think this is something Marco mentioned a long time ago. Um, so uh, that wording will have to change a little too and be initialed in the contract. Yeah, he's yeah. correct, but well, Marco is correct and Bob Parent is correct. The protective coating is not is not a favored, uh, but even to, to a higher authority, the Department of the Interior frowns on using protective coating on that type of stone for outdoor protection. It, it's 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 more causes more damage than it than it preserves. So, uh, Amy, I, you're you're right, or Bob's right, and Marco's right, uh, certainly. Um, can, I know this is a bit of a jump, um, although it's certainly within the agenda item. Um, Michael, did you hear back from Bob Parent that um, they're considering for the Lady Liberty project, not actually re-engraving on the stone, but just having the bronze tablets preserve yeah. the names? Because it's like, apparently it's best practice that if you actually keep recarving into old stone, you actually can cause structural damage. You're, you're saying, yeah, we're, this is not really in front of us, but I'll, I'll address it briefly, Madam Chairman. 
Yeah, it, it, that methodology of putting reascribing the names on the on the on the body of the of the statue itself um, is is not a favored practice, quite frankly, and it's frowned upon by the Department of the Interior. And since the statue and park is all is on the National Historic Register, they write the rules, and you you have to obey the rules. But uh, two things: number one, um, the uh, the when the, the process of the names fading begins as soon as you're finished. So it may be another 10 years and the names will begin to fade again. But, it, and besides that, the other thing is uh, when you drill or uh, when you drill into a granite, uh, especially one that's 140 years old, you run the risk of cracking. Um, uh, and we all know that when you crack stone, it, it doesn't heal itself, it gets worse. Uh, expansion, contraction, uh, cold, hot, it, bad things happen. So uh, to the statue, to the, to the base of the statue. Uh, so th that being said, the Department of Interior frowns upon, uh, and I, I got an argument with the guy in the Department of Interior. I mean, we had some, I mean, we were both blunt. I wanted to reinscribe him and he was very blunt and saying, no, you're not. So after we argued, I had to say, well, you're right. Um, and, and so with the, uh, that methodology is no longer accepted. And for those reasons, and so I, have I will to say, say, I don't think I understood the amount of knowledge that I would start to accrue on this committee about different things. <laughs> like I've yeah. learned a lot about stone in the last year. Yeah, well, I mean, anybody who drills in brick or concrete or stone, you you run the risk of cracking. It may be in front of you or maybe behind you or maybe another end, but cracking can occur. And once it does, especially to an outdoor statue that's 140 years old, Water gets in, heat is contraction. Uh, bad things can happen, so they said, "Don't do it." So after I lost the argument, I said, "All right, we won't do it." Uh, so that's how it stands. Yes. Well, I mean, we're we're learning, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Right, so, so it's going to be, so be bronze, a bronze. Yeah, they're John. Be bronze the, tablets. The, okay. Yeah, exactly. The, the accepted mm -hmm. alternative, which the Department of Interior agreed is an acceptable uh, alternative. As you put it in bronze, mm -hmm. and you just envision uh, your pillow that's rectangular in shape, mm -hmm. uh, and it's up about 30 or 40 degrees, and the bronze names are, are right there, like uh, north, south, east, and west. Well, the proper names that are there will be on a, on a bronze uh, tablet, mm -hmm. and they'll be there forever. Great. I mean, and, and so that's, that's the methodology that they say you will do. Well, it's a good thing. All right, so um, the MIFA murals contract. Wait uh, a minute, were we, can you just tell me, were we done with the, the war memorial? Yep. Okay, so they have to make a new application? No. No, so war memorial, uh, we're just, we're working to fix the errors in the contract, which we're allowed to do uh, by crossing out and then initialing in the margin or shifting and then initialing in the margin with the original parties. Um, and anything that gets an extension beyond its contract will then need a, a short addendum drafted by the city solicitor, which will be added and then re-signed. Um, the good thing about all of that is that um, Amy did some good work to move us onto using DocuSign. So uh, in the future, instead of uh, using paper copies, everything's now electronic. Um, for, for every contract we're doing moving forward, um, and a few this cycle have been done that way, which is great, because then you just go in, you make the change, and you send it to the first person on the email chain, right? Um, it's very simple to make changes that way, um, and it creates a really easy, uh, you know, electronic trail of who signed, who signed when, right? So that's all really good, and we used part of the admin budget to purchase that um, so that we'll have access to that for the next few years. Is it a three-year contract, Amy, or do we have to re-up every year? It's it's every year, and it's actually called Sign Now, but it's the same as DocuSign, yeah. I, the one thing is that I don't know if we can use it for preservation restrictions because one of the signatures has to be notarized, and the, but we're looking into it. Okay, um, with the MIFA murals piece, um, we still need to write a contract uh, for that. I think it's... Pretend. We've been working really hard to get through all of the preservation restrictions, housing restrictions, and backlogged contracts that were not done. 
Um, and we're going one by one and we're getting them done. And the last contract that really has not been drafted at all is the uh, MIFA murals one. Um, and um, I think the, the contract subcommittee um, will meet soon. Um, but the biggest issue is the contract terms, specifically around what does it mean for something to be kept in perpetuity, right? So what um, MIFA suggested was that they would um, effectively loan these murals in perpetuity to the city um, if they were not able to restore the, the theater. And that if the Victory Theater was fully restored, then the murals would be returned to, um, would be returned to MIFA and would be, um, you know, reinstalled on either end of the proscenium like they were supposed to be, right? Um, so it's a, it's a perpetual loan um, or a, a permanent loan, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but I, I guess I've seen that in two places, Amy. I've seen permanent loan. I've also seen in perpetuity if the theater is never okay. restored. Okay, I never saw that, but um, one of the things, um, um, I know I spoke with Bob Parent recently about it, and he, the thing is, uh, Mike McManus was the person who Don Sanders spoke to about um, the, this idea, this project of installing the murals in the City Hall ballroom. Um, but Mike McManus has left. He was the DPW person who's left. And so Bob Parent actually didn't know about it. So luckily we, we discovered that. And now he's, you know, um, he's gonna be talking to Don Sanders to try to get an understanding of it. Cause that's really important to know that it can be done from the city hall point of view. And, um, you know, from the Bob Parent's position since he would be involved in it. So that's the next step yeah. is really having conversations with Bob Parent um, and making sure that he's on board with the feasibility of having them installed in the ballroom and then coming up with contract terms that feel like they're workable, like what is the right language? Um, and I spoke with the city solicitor last week and she has some ideas about that um, and has been doing some research around what does it look like to write a contract term? Um, a lot of our contracts are really interesting, right? Like it's, some of them are, are kind of getting to be templates, right? Almost a, we've done this kind of project before, let's take that one out and let's shift those terms and this contract would work for them too. And then you have a number of contracts each cycle that are just really different. <laughs> and require some research and require um, some real flexibility and thinking about how to tackle that particular, um, you know, the, the scope of that project. So this one, I think will be a little bit unique because of the, because of what we're talking about here with them being put in, installed in the city hall ballroom. Um, and then at some point, if and when the Victory Theater is, is fully restored, then returned and reinstalled where they were originally. Okay. Um, Amy, did you have anything to say about the Jackson Street first time home buyer affordable housing project? No, actually, I was going to ask you because I don't really know um, what the latest is with the housing restriction that Kathy was working on. I thought that she had completed it, but I, I really have to look back and see. Um, I'll look right now to see if I can find that. But um, Okay. Um, that sounds good. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I know she was working on it, but I don't know what she ended up doing in terms of um, how complete it is or if she was able to start circulating it for feedback. Um, my last piece um, in this section is just Smith's Ferry. Um, Olivia Mazel, I see that you're here. Do you want to speak to Smith's Ferry or is it, are you here for some other reason? I think she's muted, Madam Chairman. Hello. Am Hello. I here? Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Hi. Hi everyone. Happy New Year. Um, um, Smith's Ferry, how, how can I answer your questions? So I think the, the question we had was just that we were following up on uh, what would it look like to put the permanent sign there that we had discussed? Uh, when we get a new DPW and a new parks director personnel in place, it's on our list and it, those um, will be taken up with the new personnel. All right, I totally understand. I know there's been a lot of transition 
Um, is there anything else that you wanted to share, Olivia, while you're here? Uh, no, just listening in. Okay. Thank Appreciate you. you. Yes, um, Amy, your hand up. Yeah, so I did look up Jackson Street, and what happened, the last information on that was that um, Kathy did draft the restriction, but that it's not recorded yet because that's it's usually recorded at a later time, I guess, at the time that the, the homes are are purchased. I don't know if it's when they're purchased or when they're built, but I think it's when they're purchased. Okay, I think that probably makes sense. I think they said it was because of, um, it's just, it's, it's, it's expedient, but also just financially, it makes a lot more sense because if once you do everything at the same time, it all gets rolled into the same registry uh, deed costs versus having to do things separately. So uh, their reasons yeah. certainly made sense when yeah. they Yeah, it's at the time of closing. I just looked at the language. So for the minutes you can say at the time of closing is usually when the restriction is, re affordable housing restriction is recorded. Okay, awesome. Um, is there any other um, updates on current or past projects or questions everyone ha anyone has that they wanna air before we move to the next agenda item? Ah, uh, yes, Michael. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, with your permission, I'd like to go back to item E, which is the MIFA murals. Yes. And um, I, I, this bothered me mm -hmm. uh, since we started talking about it, the fact that <laughs> if the Victory Theater does not blossom into a, the project and be completed and all is well, um, mm -hmm. that the murals will somehow, uh, that we paid for to have restored, the citizens of the city paid for to have restored, um, I think they ought to be the property of the city of Poyo. Not that I don't trust lawyers, but I don't trust lawyers. Um, if it says permanent loan or forever or eternal, sometimes lawyers have a way of working around that to get a judge to approve uh, things that we don't want to have approved. And I just want to tell everybody up front, I would prefer that this contract read that if the Victory Theater does not come to fruition, the murals become the property of the city of Hoyo. And because I've, what we all have seen legal cases and lawyers and judges make decisions that we say, well, how could you have done that? It really says the document says one thing, but a, a judge or, uh, may say another. Uh, so I, I have to express my, I, I'm really, yeah, I, I don't have a warm and fuzzy feeling about using eternal or uh, uh, you know, on permanent loan, I would prefer the contract to read, it will become the property of the city of Hoyo. That's, that's it, there's no, there's no going back. And I think we could, you know, if, you know, at the will of the committee, we could always invite Don Sanders to come back and have that conversation with us. And I don't know, frankly, how it would go. Um, well, but we, do you we, want the money or not? I mean, we shouldn't be here Trying to make him happy. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Uh, th these murals are unique to Hoyo. They're irreplaceable. Can uh, I just? Sorry. Uh, Madam Chairman, go ahead. Can no, I go add ahead. a point? Go um, okay, go ahead, Amy. Yeah, just um, that one. I, I I totally hear what you're saying, Mike. I just want to mention that it would be very important for Bob Parent to be um, on board with that because. Um, just finding a place to store these enormous murals and to protect them could be an issue for the city. Um, you know, like they had to pay someone to store the stained glass windows, you know, or, or you know, that those had to be carefully maintained. So, I mean, I think we, we definitely would have to have Bob Parent be part of that conversation. Um, well, why don't we have know, Bob Parent and Don Sanders both come to the next meeting and, and we can have that conversation because I, I do think it's very, there's no way that the city can take the murals without knowing it's very well in perpetuity, right? And it's not just a temporary installation. It has to be a thoughtful place where it could be forever, right? And has to be installed with that in mind. So I think whatever the terms are and whatever Bob Parent's role is in that, um, I do think that that is something that um, we have to make sure every, every all parties are, are on board with before we could even possibly move forward. Michael? Madam Chairman, that's as to the storage and the display of the murals is up to the mayor and the city council. Yeah. Uh, it's up to us since we're giving them, it's our, it's under our, our wheelhouse for us as the people giving them the money to make those contracts and protect the citizens. 
uh, how it's stored, where it's stored, and where it will be displayed is up to the mayor and the city council, whoever that may be at that particular time. It's not up to us. Uh, I just wanna make sure that the murals don't leave town 20 years from now because some judge or some attorney was able to work some deal out. That, that's what I'm, that's a non-issue. Where it's displayed and why is a non-issue. That's up to the mayor and the city council. I don't well, want to- mm -hmm, Sure, and in terms of storage, I don't think there ever would be storage because by contract terms, they have to be displayed. Right. Um, and they have to be installed in the city hall ballroom um, for public viewing, right? Otherwise, there's no public benefit, right? And that is the goal of the CPC is for public benefit, right? It doesn't yes. benefit anybody to have them just in storage. Right. Um, and in fact, they're in storage now, right? Um, with the restorer that will be doing the work. Um, so one thing um, to, to just name, and then I, I'd love us to, to try to move on. Um, Right now, we have, you know, the terms we put for the city council, which said that it was going to be a permanent loan, right? So that's what was approved by the city council. Um, if we want something that is really different than that, I think we might have to go back to city council in terms of approving the terms. Um, and in the meantime, I think the subcommittee should certainly meet um, that reviews contracts and, and meet with the city solicitor to have that conversation and talk about what the terms need to be. Beautiful. And I think then we go from there. Good idea. Okay. Um, so we're going to move now um, to um, doing a review of the executive session that we did in the last meeting. Um, Mary, do you have easy access to the minutes from the executive session that we did in the last meeting? Uh, oh, they were, they were right with the other minutes. Okay. Open well, I, aren't they aren't they with the minutes i'm I, because i sent them all in one chunk you see there was a second set set on the bottom yep yeah i'm just scrolling down now okay um so i just wanted to kind of read this into the record and make sure that the kind of the record of our executive session was captured publicly um, so members present uh, we went into executive session in the last uh meeting for a short period of time um, the members present were myself, uh, Michael Falsetti, Kip Foley, John Kelly, um, that also needs to be shifted to EY, uh, Marco Crescentini and uh, Mary Moriarty. Um, and we opened up the executive committee meeting at 7, 12 p.m. Um, a motion to increase Minister Lindau's pay rate to $30 retroactive to July uh, 1st, 2021 was made by Falsetti and seconded by Crescentini. In the discussion that followed, members present all spoke positively about the value of this change and the motion passed unanimously. And the motion to close the meeting was made by Falsetti and seconded by Foley at 728, passed unanimously. All right. Um, and I um, have been working with the personnel department to move that forward in terms of um, getting the correct form to them and making sure that that happens retroactive to, to July 1. Okay. Um, the next piece of our agenda, the logistics of the public meeting. So, and I think, uh, Michael, this is a great place for that to come up to the conversation you mentioned earlier. So we have as the date and time, uh, Thursday, the 27th of January for our public meeting, starting at six o'clock. Um, and Amy has already started to talk with all of the applicants to have them sign up for time slots where they will present. At least they have a general time of where they will be in the order and where they'll be in the order. Um, and um, I think the things that I would like to talk about are, um, I assume that we'd be shifting to virtual only, but I'll, I'll open that back up um, to what does that meeting look like? Do we wanna still have a hybrid meeting versus going fully, fully virtual? Um, and um, how do we increase communication and public engagement? Um, I will say that, Amy, at this point, the notifications to local newspapers have gone out, um, although I don't know if they could be edited at this time. I don't, um, I think it's past deadline for both papers at this point. And uh, they do say, you know, that it's virtual and they tell people to contact me. So I guess if it were hybrid, I could tell them that there's a hybrid option, but um, you know, I just, I'm not sure how we would do that, the hybrid option, that's tricky, unless you did it at, maybe at city council chambers. Yeah, the, the piece that came up around hybrid, even as it was, was I, I couldn't get them to, to really um, 
the senior center wasn't really going to work, unfortunately, because of just their, they're not set up to do a hybrid meeting and there's some issues of bandwidth there. Um, and so the only places that are really set up for that are the city council chambers. Um, and then also um, there's one space in the Dean Tech building. Um, but given where we are currently with numbers and also like I had sort of thought we were gonna need to pivot that way because of numbers. And we did put that out in the newspapers um, just cause we hit that deadline before this meeting. Um, I'd love to know what folks think in terms of us moving forward. Yeah, Michael. Uh, Madam Chairman, wasn't Izzy on his way to city hall for a meeting? I mean, the city council meets at city chambers. Now it's one thing if the mayor next week says no more public meetings, it's all, that's his prerogative. Uh, but until then, I mean, what do we think as a committee if we want to go hybrid or or not? Uh, but I think it's something we should vote on as a committee for this particular meeting. Uh, okay. I'm a big fan of hybrid meetings. Uh, yeah, I, I prefer I think to because have the school department went fully virtual with all of their meetings recently. Oh, that's, that's what I was leaning yeah, into. Fine. But um, hybrid is, hybrid is an option. I can I can speak for uh, like for planning. We have hybrid, but. Um, you know, it's not required to have a Zoom meeting. Uh, I think the school department's kind of a separate entity, you know, in that respect. But I could certainly, uh, you know, empathize with logistics required to get that done. It's not easy. No. And you're saying that the uh, the senior center probably does not have the the uh, no. capacity to set up a hybrid, right? No, That's they good. don't. We'd ha yeah. Likely, we'd have to be in city hall chambers. Yeah. Um, yeah. With, so what? We could do it. I, I will say I'm also freaked out about not the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd have to find some time to get down to city hall and practice it. I'm a little anxious about having to throw a hybrid meeting the first time mm -hmm. for yeah. public presentations only because of the logistics of like, I don't quite know how their system works. We're gonna have to teach all of us how to mute, unmute when they, cause some of us will, would be virtual and some of us would be in the room mm -hmm. and some presenters would be in the room and some would be virtual. And then some members of the public would be virtual and some would be in person. So like, it would be a real mix. I think almost every group would have some degree of hybridity. And I've just never had to chair that before. Not because that we couldn't, do it, yeah. but I know there's it complications. Be, it becomes a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. It does become a challenge, you know, for the person trying to conduct that meeting for sure. And I knew you got, so. You got, I people, wanna... you got people, um, you got people coming in on Zoom, you're also have people phoning in, and it's pound six for this, star nine for that. You know, it's not easy. But I'm, you know, I'm so sympathetic. that there are some individuals that, you know, with the COVID situation, I, you know, I respect folks who want to be very cautious. So I'm comfortable going either way, to be honest. Helene, you wanted to speak? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, just in terms of this piece of it, I mean, it just, it seems like a challenging decision was made. And, you know, we don't know, but it, but it's, I mean, if you go through the whole process and spend the resources to try to figure out making something, any meeting, honestly, right now, hybrid, and then that's not possible. It has to all be online because, you know, things in the next few weeks get worse. Um, it just, it, to me, it seems like this is an okay time to kind of these next few weeks to err on the side of caution in terms of being more um, remote. And uh, so that would be kind of my perspective of that just seems the sort of this, the, the most straightforward. It's what's in the newspaper. It just, it seems like it is the clearest um, process at this point for something that's coming up fairly soon. So. I apologize, Michael. I, I you know, maybe I, I got it wrong and I should have reached out to everyone to have an emergency meeting. Um, where we could have made this decision earlier this week or, or, or last week, as it were. Um, 
Well, Mayor, I don't know. Sure, it, I mean, uh, the mayor is the mayor. If he says all meetings will now be on Zoom, he's the mayor. No, no, um, no. I, the well, mayor has no, not said okay. that. It, it, For sure, we could do a hybrid meeting. And initially, I was the one that really wanted to do it. Like, I was really excited about it, actually. Um, but that was back in November when, yeah, no, I don't know, things felt different. That's okay. We, we can we can vote right now as a board. And all of us say, well, all those who want an all Zoom meeting, say aye. All those who want a hybrid meeting, say aye. And that'll okay. be that. Um, okay. John, your hand's up. I, I think I think Khalid's comments make a lot of sense because you know I'd hate to vote for hybrid and then a week from now things get worse and we're forced into going you know with a, with a Zoom meeting anyway. So maybe I think I would side on the cautious side to what Khalid said and just for this round just go with a maybe a virtual meeting be the best. Mary, your hands up. So it was already published in the paper that it would be virtual is that correct we had a deadline for all the newspapers last week where we had to put our, our notice in um and it was right as i mean at least again i apologize maybe i should have had an emergency meeting and pull this all together to decide but i felt like i had to decide and we had to get it in the paper oh. and like in my own family we were dealing with quarantine and i was like man i couldn't even be at a hybrid meeting right now <laughs> like i would have to be virtual right now um it, it just it all felt like the complications could be insurmountable in that moment when like we had to make that decision and get things to the paper. I was like, well, what if half our committee has to be, I'm um, whatever. I was thinking about all the complication of it. And I felt like maybe for this year, I just had to admit that virtual made more sense it, or it, made, it, it was okay to be more cautious. And hopefully this is the last time we have to do it, right? Hopefully next year we're at a different place where we're meeting in person again and we're kind of societally like, you know, have, have moved beyond it but it does feel like we're in a different spot right now, even than we were five, six weeks ago. <clears throat> okay, so I'd like to make a motion for us to have a virtual meeting. Um, do I hear a second? Second. I'll second. I'll second. Um, and all in favor? Aye. 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 I appreciate Aye. you all. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm sorry, because I, I think, I, I will say one piece about open meeting law that drives me crazy is I can't just send out an email, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, you can't, no. I can't just send out an email and say like, hey, can everyone just give me a quick sense of what you want to do, right? Like it's not, it, it makes it a little clunky in terms of being able to be responsive in the moment when things are shifting and we had that newspaper deadline. So, but thank you for approving it retroactively. Okay. Um, okay, my last question about the public meeting is around ways that we can increase attendance and then also engage people who attend. So one of my thoughts was, um, I can make some snazzy social media posts on Canva that look pretty and, you know, publicize it and whatnot and make the Zoom link a QR code and, you know, I can do that sort of thing. Um, and we can start sharing that around. Um, and I think I'm Facebook friends with almost everybody, or I can hunt you down, <laughs> maybe friends, Facebook friends with me, and then we can each kind of share within our circles that it's happening. Um, and then uh, and I'd love some other ideas around getting folks to attend or just kind of be aware that it's happening. Um, and then I'd like to think about how to engage people who arrive, like maybe there's some sort of Google survey that folks are doing after each presentation, or folks have to give us feedback, right? To what extent are you in support of this project, right? On a zero to 10 scale, or I think that sort of thing could be helpful um, just to kind of make people feel like they're being engaged with who come to attend. Any thoughts or yeah, ideas? Chairman, it's going to be one long meeting. That's all I can say. I mean, we're going to be there until midnight. I don't think so. Google surveys can be fast. It can just be like a zero to 10. Like, give us a sense. Like, everyone, you have two minutes to click because we're going to be transitioning from one to the other anyway. There's always like a little bit of dead time um, between presentations. So I thought maybe we could do it in between each one. But you're right. It would have to be something fast. It couldn't be something that was, you know, super lengthy. Amy? wanted to mention it's interesting you mentioned the google survey because the last time we were going to have uh, the public meeting which was right at the beginning of the pandemic in march 2020 when i literally had to rush over and put a sign up saying it was 
um, it was canceled. Um, <laughs> I actually arranged a Google survey. I had it all ready. And what I was going to do is share the link with people so people could go to the link. And I, I was thinking, you know, maybe they wouldn't necessarily have to do it in the moment. They could think about it and, um, you know, complete it later, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I was going to hand out a piece of paper, too, that had the link, which is something we can't do if it's, it's remote, but um, it still could be, the link could still be shared, you know, during the meeting or something like that. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Any other ideas? Idea yeah, I like that. So would that be on each project that is being presented? Yeah, we can talk more about what the logistics okay. look like for that. Okay. Okay, any other ideas or anything that you particularly want out of the public meeting that we need to make sure that we we build in time for or a tone you want to strike or an announcement that you think we should make, any information that you think we should share? Amy? I mean, I just think a very quick statement, um, just to just very basically say what CPA is and what projects are, are eligible, um, or even if it was just to share the eligibility. Well, I don't know if sharing the chart would probably be too elaborate unless we shared this. There's a simplified version of the chart, because I just know that some people, you know, have commented in the past survey that they didn't understand what was eligible and what wasn't. So just a thought, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've told everybody that their presentation should be very short, only five minutes, and there's only, um, I think, 12 of them, so um, that it should only be, well, probably be a little over an hour, but it may be just an hour for people to present. Things always take longer than you think they will, so I'm assuming it will be six to eight, um, but we've had years where we've had to almost do, we, we did two nights one year, right? Because there were so many applicants. So, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, confident we'll get through all of them in one night, but yeah, it might be a little bit of a later meeting in terms of folks just putting it on their calendar and knowing that I do think on zoom, it's possible it can move a little faster. Um, but, but I don't know that. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Will there be a moment for questions about each project from the public? So in the past, what we've done um, is after each project, there's, you know, a five minute presentation, and then there's time for each of us to ask questions that we have for the applicants, right? So I would highly suggest, um, we're going to talk about the timeline and um, a possible scoring um, guide that I have for us um, after this conversation. Um, but I think our goal is to have scanned the applications ahead of time so that if you have questions, you're ready to go, right? So you can ask something like, can you tell me who's written letters of support for your project? You know, or can you tell me where you see this will impact the community in five years? Or um, can you walk me through the logistics of this, right? Like what, anything that comes up for you as a question, this is really our opportunity to hear from the applicant directly before we start voting on whether or not we want to vote for their project. So anything that you have that you think is a concern for sure, folks should be ready to bring up so that they have the opportunity um, to respond to it, right? That's sort of us showing our due diligence as a committee. Um, otherwise, if, if we don't kind of bring it up and then later in a meeting where we're discussing it, we bring up a concern that we never let the applicant respond to. Um, not that that doesn't happen sometimes, right? But, you know, the applicant might feel like, how come I didn't get the chance to respond to that? Um, I just want to mention that our notices state that we want input from the public. So, um, I don't know, I just would worry that if people are coming thinking that they have a voice and they don't get a chance. I just have a question, Amy. I'm just not done talking. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I think we have to do our due diligence and ask questions. And then I think on Zoom, it's going to be a mix um, of, I think some folks will want to unmute and ask questions from the public. We also have to create time for this public to give support effectively, like affirmations for projects. Um, Cause we've had that happen in the past too. Folks come and say, wanna say, hey, I came in support of this project and here's why I support it. Um, and folks I think can do that in the chat and also can unmute. Um, and Amy, you and I just need to figure out the logistics of the chat 
So if somebody says something in the chat, we have to read it into the record verbally. And we just need to figure out how to do that and when to do that and how to, you know, for you to cue to me that you're ready to share someone's um, response that was in the chat. Um, and then I think after each one, we should remind them to use the Google survey um, to give us feedback on how in some, how much of you know support they have for that project and um, anything they wanna say about that project. Um, John? Yeah, I would just uh, caution have you participated in many, many um, public hearings and it is important to have public input, um, but I just caution folks that certain individuals in the public may actually take control or try to take control of the whole process and it could go on for leaving. 15, 20, 30 minutes. So but maybe want to get some thought to kind of framing, you know, who could speak and how long they could speak for, because there are individuals out there who mean well, um, but they're going to be the whole 30 minute rendition of, you know, their, their uh, the view of certain projects. So I just would frame I that and I would say sense. that in all questions and all that stuff should go through the chair. So they don't, you know, because what will happen is to play devil's advocate, you get, you get some individuals starting to ask questions of the applicant directly, mm -hmm. you don't want that. Those questions okay. should go through you as the chair of the committee that you, you know, will go to the applicant. So again, got to be very careful when you have public input because there's just a ton of different personalities out there. But I'm not, I'm not saying we should not have that. But I think you have to give some okay. thought to how many times someone can speak and how long, you know, how many questions they can ask. Okay, we'll I think be, that makes sense. Yeah, otherwise we'll, we'll be around until midnight or one in the morning. Although I will say, CPC is a little different than planning board. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> There's are some real division. In some ways, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> you know, I will say that our biggest thing, and this is why I'm saying, hey, let's make sure that we're sharing this widely in our circles and encouraging folks to attend. Our biggest issue is folks don't show up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, people are like, wait, what projects are you doing? I don't even know CPC existed. What's that? Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, there's a lot of that in our community. So I think anything mm -hmm. that we can do to just get public input, like, we're not so much like batting people off. We're like, please, one and all, give us some feedback. We need some. <laughs> okay. So I think anything we can do to encourage people to attend and, and to give us some feedback makes sense. Um I, I appreciate what you're saying about questions should go, you know, for example, we can set up a, a process, Amy, where folks have to message, um, have to private message um, you, you know, and then you can feed questions to me and um, I can bring those questions to them. Um, and we can also limit folks to like one minute of, of public discourse or Mary. I'm totally in favor of what John just said. But I also think um, a lot of planning is going to have to come into it in advance because, for example, in order to establish who's going to go first, um, you know, they're just establishing the order. That would mean that Amy has to see who's Public queuing comment. up for yeah. comments, you That's know, true. and uh, just uh, so much mo more monitoring or either Amy or you. So yeah, it yeah. sounds like a lot of planning is going to have to go into it. But I totally yeah. agree. And you must stay in control. Okay. All right. So Amy and I will talk about logistics around how folks will like queue up because you're right in person, they line up at the mic and that's how you know what the order is. Um, without that, we'll have to be thoughtful about setting up a virtual queue basically of folks knowing they need to, you know, message Amy and say, you know, I want to be in the queue and then Amy will have to kind of tell people, right, or I will, right, we'll have to figure out who's doing that and what that looks like. Okay, good points. Thank you, everybody. Um, if anyone else thinks of anything else um, later, um, please let me know if there's something logistically we need to think through that pops up in your mind so we can get ready. Okay. Um, the next piece is the process for reviewing and voting on the fiscal year 22 projects. So I had two documents that I had linked into the agenda and I don't know if folks um, had the time to to look at those. So I wanna spend a little bit of time looking at them together um, and hearing um, questions that folks have, um, comments folks have. So the first one um, is here um, and I'll share screen too. I just put it in the chat and it's the scoring criteria. So I drafted this based off of um, New Bedford 
um, had a scoring guide that was similar and a number of CPCs use this kind of, of, of way of, of scoring projects before you then take them on. Um, it's a little bit more work on our part outside of meetings, um, but then it makes the decision process move faster. So the benefit to that is a little bit of consistency and also us voting on projects faster. And the, the pro there is that what we're finding is that the logistics, right, of determining contract terms, of drafting contracts, of getting contracts signed, of getting restrictions done, like all of that takes time. We have projects that are year, year and a half old who are still going through that process, right, that should have had money released to them and they should have been rocking and rolling a year ago. But it's a slow process sometimes to move through that. So, you know, the goal is that this money is released on July 1 to our applicants and they're immediately then moving forward with their projects. But if we take months to sort of vote and decide and get through contract terms and we're not really done with that until May, then the process to move that through contracts and get all of that done by July is unlikely. So I'm hoping that this process um, will mean that we'll be able to vote on projects quicker. So this project, the process would work is everyone over the next, you know, four weeks between now and our next full CPC meeting where it's just us, not the public meeting, um, folks would go ahead and start going through the applications um, and you would start scoring them, right? And the value of that is, and um, Amy will send out a, a, a chart to you um, where folks will put in their scores. And the reason why that's helpful is because in the first meeting that we have after the public meeting, we can start by saying, okay, here are the five top scorers. Let's start with those five, right? And let's have pros and cons of each one and vote, right? Because we've already kind of done this work of the due diligence of scoring them. So if they've been scored, if they scored highly on average amongst all people, there's a really good chance that they're going to be funded, right? Um, and then we would take them successively based on the average score in terms of reviewing them. Okay, questions, comments, thoughts. And I'd love any thoughts about the chart itself, right? Because this is also a chart that can be revised, right? Based on the categories or what excellent might mean or good might mean for a category. I, I like the document. I think it's going to give us, um, you know, um, I, I hope much easier to score each project, you know, with the standard criteria. You know, we're all kind of, you know, where, wherever we come out, each one of us individually, there's kind of a numerical value that will be helpful. Any other thoughts? Uh, Madam Chairman, I, I agree with questions. John. Yep. Sorry, Mike. Go ahead. No, Madam Chairman, I was just to confirm uh, what John said. I, it's a very well done. Both both uh, presentations on the scoring criteria and the application itself of the groups of the people lined up is very good. It's very it's right there. It's informative and uh, it's good 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 product uh, you produced. Okay. So I just want to name into the public record. So the criteria will be goals alignment. So how connected are they to CPC goals and priorities? Benefit to the city, right? To what extent will this uh, immediately benefit the city? Um, and then public support, right? Do we see a lot of public support? Is it cross um, a number of stakeholders? Um, is there really uh, a lot of due diligence? Um, you know, supporting the application. Have they done a really nice job putting the documents together so that we have everything that we need? Um, shows that they're organized, they're, they're self-directed, they're on it. Project feasibility, um, sources of funding, and restrictions and contractual processes. Um, I will say that um, Amy and I spoke about her scoring um, the supporting documentation and also scoring 
her per perception of the restrictions in contractual processes. Um, and she's gonna share that out to everybody. So not that her, hers has to be yours, right? But given that she's got her, her eye on all these contracts and has also seen them you now for several rounds of funding, right? She has a good perspective around what supporting documentation looks like when it's done well or restrictions in contractual processes. Sometimes there are conversations that applicants have had with us around um, these restrictions and contractual processes that make us understand that they're really willing to kind of go into these restrictions or particularly not, um, or maybe don't understand the restriction process as well as we would want them to. Um, and there are some applicants that have come to us multiple times. So there's also sometimes a history where an applicant has been a really great applicant in the past and has shown great due diligence, or maybe they haven't, right? And so that sort of piece is a kind of a institutional knowledge that Amy has. So she's gonna score these two and share these out to the committee. Um, and again, not that it has to be yours, but I think it's good institutional knowledge to share. And then the priorities at a glance. So I grabbed this from our preservation plan. It's a little bit adapted, um, but it's almost exactly word for word. There were sections that I just um, pulled out and sort of uh, made easier to understand in, certain, in terms of you know making it all the same language so it could be a bulleted list. Um, but this gives us a sense um, of what our stated goals are in each of the three categories. So as you're reading over applications, this is your go-to document along with the preservation plan as you're trying to figure out, does this align with our goals or not? I will also say that going back in and looking at our uh, preservation plan made me realize that there are certain projects that we haven't seen come in front of us yet, right? where it's saying that this is something we're supposed to be tackling, but no applicant has come forward uh, yet who could offer that. So that's something that's interesting to me. Um, like I had an interesting conversation with um, Yoni, um, no, mess up his last name terribly, Glowgower? Yes, Glowgower. Glowgower, okay, I wasn't 100% off. Um, around the fact that it says in open space and recreation, that um, we would address climate, climate readiness was sort of not named in the preservation plan, um, but seemed to kind of be alluded to in all these different places. Um, and it says specifically that we should be addressing the control of invasive species um, and that we should be engaging in projects that increase our city's air quality and capacity for stormwater filtration. It's really specific, <laughs> right? Um, around, you know, are we increasing the downtown tree canopy or are we developing downtown green spaces, which yes, it's a pocket park, but really the other benefit is that, hey, we have this stormwater issue and this is gonna fix that infrastructurally. So that was interesting. And, and we had a conversation with that around, you know, could you ever see yourself putting these kinds of projects forward? Cause it says it's one of our, our, our goals and yet no one's come forward concerning it. Um, and I think this is something we can put out to the public too, around like, here are some of our goals and we love to see projects come forward about this in the future, um, right? Like the idea of improving and supporting citizens um, access to the river, right? Um, so I think there's some interesting um, pieces in the preservation plan when you get into it um, that just make me excited about the kinds of different projects we're, we're gonna see in the future. Michael, you had your hand up. Uh, well, Madam Chairman, uh, we, we have to be aware that the preservation law written by the state says in pretty stark terms, we're not here to substitute, we're not here to use, the, you're not supposed to use the money for what the city yeah. should be paying for as the guardian of the waterways, guardian right. of the trees. They say specifically, you can't use the money for that. So we have, although we may want to, we got to be yeah. aware that the law, the state law itself is, is very is very upfront on what you're allowed to spend and what you're not allowed to spend. It just comes to mind, uh, I remember reading that you can't use it to do the things that the city ought to be doing of itself. Water filtration, um, evasive species, trees. If I was the guy from the, the state CPA guy, I'd say drop dead. Your city, should, this is, that comes out of your city budget. You, you can't, the, I, I, so we have to be kind of mindful of we may yeah. have to do something, but the law may, we got to be aware of the law. That's all. The supplanting provision says that you're not allowed to supplant something in the current budget. 
So if there's a line item for invasive species removal, um, you know, we couldn't, for example, say, well, you can X that out of your budget because we'll cover it on ours, right? That's completely not, um, you know, allowable. Um, but what is allowable is some amount of coordination around like, well, there's a positive benefit to this project, the city um, that maybe goes beyond just being a pocket park, right? But might align with some other priority around making sure that we are addressing climate resilience or addressing water filtration, right? Um, I was reading a really interesting article last week about smudgification, right? And how like you can use all these great um, kind of micro ways, right? To kind of create, um, you know, public spaces that are just really thoughtful about stormwater, right? And it's not like you're doing stormwater filtration, but it's going to, you know, have this other benefit to the city. So why not? So I, I think I'm excited, honestly, looking at the preservation plan and realizing there's so many projects that really have a lot of cross benefit um, and just can be that the, the funding can be more flexible, right? I think a lot of people think of CPC as it's a park, right? And sure, it can be, but green space is so much more than just that. And not that I don't want us to keep funding parks because I do. <laughs> I want us to have the most, you know, rock star parks anywhere, right? Um, but it's exciting to think of all the different ways that CPC funding could be used to address different needs in our city too. Okay, any other questions about preservation plan, finding the preservation plan goals, scoring criteria? Because we won't really talk again as a committee until we start meeting to discuss projects and sharing how we've scored them and then starting to vote on projects, right? Because as a committee, next time we meet, we're not really meeting, we're just taking in what folks are presenting to us, right? There's not any kind of internal talking during that meeting. So the next time we meet, um, we'll be in, well, we need to set the meeting time. In general, it's been the second Wednesday of every month, usually, although sometimes it's shifted a little bit here and there. But I do wanna actually open that back up to have a conversation around potentially shifting the day, because I know, for example, that Israel is now named as the, the city councilor attached to CPC, he has ordinance at the same time. So I do know that we have to shift the meeting time and date. Um, I'm just not quite sure what to, right? And in terms of what all, all our availability is, what that looks like. What's interesting, Megan, is that for some reason, ordinance is meeting tonight, Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Historically, they've always met on Tuesdays because we had that discussion in planning oh. board last night. We don't know why they've, if it's just a one time where they've shifted their, their firm meeting because quite often we'd have joint meetings with them on Tuesdays. So I don't okay. go on there with their schedule. But someone should get some clarification. Is it going to okay. be Wednesdays for ordinance or is it just this one time? Okay, that's a good idea. How often does what ordinance meet? Uh, I think monthly. Okay. But I'm not, I'm not sure. So I'm, I'm tempted to not set a, a date this meeting because I feel like we need to hear from everybody. And so maybe on the public presentation day, the 27th, the, the very last piece of the meeting, we can just coordinate what that last, what our next meeting date will be and what that recurring meeting will be moving forward. Mary? Two things. One is that you're gonna have an awful lot to do that night. I think you're better okay. off making the appointment now. And two, on the 27th, that's the end of January. What if we decide our best date is like, I don't know, February 8th. That's a random number. I don't know what date it is. <laughs> well, you don't have enough time to publish it in the newspaper. So I think you should just pick a date today. Okay. We could try. We just might need to ch change it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Since we don't have Israel okay. here. Oh, cool. that's okay. I mean, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, let's close out this agenda um, and then move to other. Um, the My only update on the Jackson Street build day is just that given everything that's been happening with weather, um, personal circumstances, folks who are in quarantine, we can't have the build day this Saturday. Um, and we're going to speak to them around what that uh, date looks like, but hopefully um, the weather will improve a little bit and maybe later um, in February. 
um, we'll be able to do that, but we won't be able to do it this week. It was also just too much to kind of pull together when we were meeting today and the bill day would have been Saturday. Um, so um, underneath other, um, I have establishing the meeting date. Um, and I also want to talk a little bit more about the video proposal that I talked about last time. I realized I wanted to bring that up again. Um, is there anything else that we want to address under other that folks want to bring up, Mary? Yes, um, I, I'd like to mention that um, the GluTac application, um, they might, it might be a, a situation that, it's, uh, that they're pressed for time. Uh, so I, I'm going to want to, I wanted to bring that up in other, uh, to, to tell you what I'm talking about. Do you want that now or do you want to wait for other? <laughs> yeah, no, I think we're, we're in other. So go ahead and, and okay. start and then we'll talk about the meeting and the video proposal. Okay. So, um, the application for, um, GluTac includes, um, hiring a crew of, um, adolescents to go out there and do the work. And in order to get through all of the details of that, they will need plenty of time. Um, so I, I don't know what you do. I mean, should he be uh, applying for an emergency application or, I mean, he'll give his presentation on January 27th, but um, just to let you know in advance, it, you know, it might be a situation that they're in a rush to get everything done. You know what their deadline is? I don't off the top of my head. I think, you know, my goal with this, this process of us scoring applications ahead of time means that let's say we meant Thursday, February 17th, we would start to vote on projects on that day. Which okay. means even if they, they moved as an emergency application, they wouldn't get an answer before then anyway. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Because that's our yep. next regularly scheduled meeting. So that's fine. I just thought I'd mention it in advance in case it became a big deal. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Michael? Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, Mary, uh, it, this is an aside, uh, but if they're gonna pay adolescents um, to do the work and they're gonna pay them, um, you, may, you may have run into problems with the age of the people of the young men and women that are going to do the work. What's their age? Have they have they been OSHA trained uh, to do the work they're supposed to do? Are they covered by the city insurance? Should they get hurt on the job? Uh, once you get into a pay situation, it's a lot different than just having volunteers, because all that uh, if, the, yeah. if this is a city of Poyoke property, um, then. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Um, all, all those things may, may come to, to, to roost and they may have to answer those questions. So there may be a lot more that meets the eye. That's all I'm saying. I would yeah, be um, happy to have them talk, but I, as far as I know, they're, they're, is this, this is the program with Greenagers, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So there's a nonprofit that kind of does a lot of the admin piece, like they're this is something they've done. This is a model they've done in the Berkshires in terms of working with youth. Sorry. Um, I'm going to have to go pretty soon because of dinner. I thought this was going to end after an hour. So um, just to put that out there. Um, but I believe that a lot of that is kind of built in in terms of this is like a youth organization that works with youth, has experience and a track record training them, and then wants to bring this to Holyoke to, you know, to, but it's not reinventing the wheel um, and, you know, has a, a plan set up. But I think that's for kind of, you know, when there's the presentation, just wanted to. Yeah, uh, Helene, thank you for that bit of information, but I think it should be going to you guys as the park and rec guys, because the city of Hoyle, what if the mayor says, I, no, I don't want this. I mean, he's the mayor. Uh, I can't imagine he'd want, he'd say that, but I'm just saying it, it's something that should be going in front of the park and rec that you guys should look at it and say, yeah, we approve it. Good luck. So there's some- We're, We've signed on to it. But we're supporting it. So. Oh, okay. I, yeah. I didn't know that. Uh, and the mayor has that. too. Amy made yeah. a new page in the application where the mayor has to sign off on all projects on city property. Okay, so the mayor has signed off on this. Okay, um, that's yeah. um, beautiful. One yeah, point uh, of Yoni, no, he, just that he has the, done 
the Greenagers piece, um, technically they can't be named in the application as a co-applicant um, because of procurement. And so it will be a organization that will work with Holyoke youth to do this work. Blakely Greenagers. Yeah. So Yoni is working okay. with all of the parties. All of the parties have been involved, Michael. And, and he is working closely with the procurement office, with the mayor's office, and with Parks and Rec. Beautiful. No, very good. It's a really exciting project. I can't wait to hear more about it on the 27th. Um, okay. Um, so the deadline for scores, I, I think, stepping back, February 17th, which is a Thursday, is that a meeting day or time that would work for folks tentatively? And then we have to run it by Israel Rivera too. Sorry, could you repeat that February 17th? Which is a Thursday. Yeah, Parks does, I think we're doing the third Thursday. Yeah, that doesn't, I, I think that's, that's gonna be our standing time. So that wouldn't work for myself. Okay, what about the 10th, which would be the second Thursday? That's okay. conservation. Why are we moving to Thursdays? Are we moving to Thursdays instead of Wednesdays? So I think it makes well, sense on the, if we don't know Izzy's schedule and it just maybe makes sense to discuss the change of time until we have that information at the next meeting on the 27th, that would be my thought because to set something around to change it again that. yeah i'm more than happy with that which means that our meeting would be wednesday the 9th unless we hear otherwise that we have to change it oh man chairman is this going to be enough time to digest all the things from the public hearing i mean are you guys going to have enough time to Get everything yeah, I, think, together. I think the goal between now that would give us, you know, one, two, three, that would give us four weeks as a committee, right, to read the applications and score them. My goal is that everybody would get the um, scores to Amy by the very, you know, latest by um, the 7th of February, like that Monday, no, so that we, she can, you know, add them are together. You gonna indicate, is this going to indicate our preference, Madam Chairman? Uh, is this going to indicate our preference? I, I just questioned the open meeting law that we're, we're making decisions. Uh, it, it, we're making a public decision in a private manner. Uh, I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm no attorney, but I'm, it just raises. It just raises. I, I know it's a process that's followed by a number of CPCs because it's modeled off of that. Um, and we won't know any of each other's. Right. And so I don't think it upsets anything on open meeting law because we're just individually okay. doing our work and sharing it with Amy. And then in the meeting, that's when we'll be able to look at all of each other's. Well, OK, if you're happy with it, no problem. I was just a little apprehensive about it. That's all. I don't think it disrupts anything on open meeting law okay. unless anyone else disagrees. Because there wouldn't be any cross communication until the meeting itself. Okay. Well, except for except for. I mean, are all of the applications and are, is all of this information available to the public right now? Yeah. It is all of this information that we're going to be working off of is available to the public right now. The applications are? Amy? Oh, the applications are available on the, yeah, the page. Yeah. It's on the website. It's been shared on social media. I just sent out... Um, the subscriber email to people about this meeting with a link to it. So it's, yeah, it is available for people to look at. And so okay. then you, you were hoping to have us have it scored and ready for the next meeting. Is that, is that what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, and, sorry, okay. when did you say the next meeting would be? Not Wednesday. decided yet. That's what she's discussing. Oh, okay. Yeah, because of it's, course I'll need time to look through everybody's scores and collate that. Yeah. So, Amy, my goal is that we would it, let's say our meeting is Wednesday the 9th. And that means that folks would get the scores to you by Monday the seventh. Well, I don't know if I can have all the scores. I mean, maybe it's simple. I I don't know. I just it'll maybe. it'll be simple enough that you'll be able to do it easily because okay. Google can tabulate them for you, right? 
Okay. Um, and then the next uh, piece that I just wanted to bring up again was the, the video proposal. So um, when I spoke at the last meeting, um, we talked about um, the potential of having six different videos made for the CPC, one of which was introductory and five were different project spots. And we had a proposal from Louis Salazar, um, who was a, a well-known you know, Holyoke artist um, who was willing to do this work. You're muted, Meg. I know, I'm telling my child to stop being loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, and uh, Louis Salazar gave us a proposal for 4,875 um, for the six videos. Um, and um, I was told to go do a little more due diligence and see if I could come up with other proposals or a sense of if that seemed reasonable. And what's come out of that is everyone that I've talked to has said that $4,800 is a really good price for that number of videos. Um, and that um, because they're being done in both English and Spanish, um, it's actually more like 12 videos. So it's actually a lot of content to ask someone to do. And I couldn't find a single person. My child's trying to build a fort. I'm so sorry. It's okay. You will survive it, Megan. Believe me, you'll survive it. <laughs> Literally, he was like dropping chairs, like blankets were following, falling. He's freaking out. <laughs> what are you trying to do right now? <laughs> All right. Is what it is. Sorry, guys. So anyway, um, the goal, of course, is to have a series of videos and then to have graphic design work done. So we have a really nice live map where folks can scroll over it and click in and really have an interactive map. Um, after the research that I did, I feel really strong that we're not going to get a cheaper proposal for anyone that can do the quality of the work that he's proposing. So I would like us to consider it. Um, and I think it's a good idea. Um, to do this work, the admin budget exists, not just to pay any salary and to do all the, you know, minutia that we have to do with, you know, sign now and that stuff. It's also to promote what we do so that the public knows what we do, right? Um, it's just part of our due diligence to the community that they know who we are and what we do. It's taxpayer funded, right? The other piece that I'm just going to name, and I know this is new information, um, I've had some lengthy conversations with the mayor about what next year looks like. And he is working with a number of groups in the city, including our department, CPC, including different grants and how they're done. And he is looking at, uh, you know, effectively asking us to pay incidentals. Right. I understand so why. So what that means is that uh, there are indirect costs to what we do, right? We use procurement, we use the you know tax assessor, the tax collector, HR, we use legal, right? So we have these you know ways that we're beneficial to the city for sure, right? But we also use city time in terms of city employee um, time and you know their efforts. So um, you know how do you you know, we also know that we need to have increased positions in legal and procurement, right? Like, you know, as a manager, he's trying to figure out how to run the city well and efficiently. And this is one of the ways to do that. Because if every way that you can, you pull together some money forward, right? Suddenly you have enough money to pay for that additional spot in legal or that additional spot in procurement. I have been talking with Andrew McCann, McMahon always butcher his last name, McMahon. Yes. Okay. Who has been doing financial work for us um, and helping us with the budget because our budget's really complicated, right? And we've been talking back and forth on if that money would have to come out of admin next year, starting next year, or is it something that we could attach to projects as like a, a, a line item attached to each project? But if we can't attach it to each project, then we have to take it out of admin. So I don't know how that affects admin next year, right? And the conversation I had with him was, well, what if there's just no money to give you? 
right? Like once we've paid for our staffer and we've done all these things that we have to do, what if there's really not any significant money left over? We've never had a lot left over, right? We've always rolled some over every year. And then it goes into the unencumbered general fund, right? Um, and his response was, well, maybe you wouldn't really pay for all of your incidentals, but on record, we would be able to ask for a certain percentage towards it in good faith, towards covering all of the expenses that CPC incurs for the city. Is, I, I mean, is that an approved? I'm saying it's money? coming to us for next year. Like it's a conversation that we're going to have in May and June before we roll into the next fiscal year. Can we do that legally through the, uh, can we, through, through the state laws? Is that legal? We know we can do it through admin. The question is, does it have to come out of admin or can we roll it into projects? And that's something Andrew is researching right now. Oh, okay. And he's been talking to Stuart Saginaw in the coalition to figure out what that means. Right. But well. I expect that we're going to have that conversation in May or June of this year. Maybe the mayor comes and joins us or whatever that looks like. But I know it's coming. So I don't know what our admin budget looks like next year. So I'm, I'm mentioning that because I want it all to be on your radar. Right. So it's not a surprise when it, it comes down the pipeline. Um, but also um, it's a question for me around, I know we have it in the admin budget this year to do this kind of work for video and potentially also for graphic design. I don't know what next year looks like in terms of what our admin budget will look like. Mary? So the question that Michael and you just discussed in regards to was it allowed, what were you talking about? Were you talking about, is it allowed that we would be paying dues out of our admin budget? Or were you talking about is it allowed that we will pay for the video production? We know that we're allowed to pay for any sort of promotion of CPC out of it. His question okay. is, do we know it's allowed to pay for indirects um, back to the city out of admin? And the answer is yes, we are allowed to do that. Um, okay. One question is if it's possible to have it in some way come out of projects, you know, that we don't know. All right, and what about Stuart Saginaw and the um, organization that we belong to? Uh, what uh, would they advise us? Andrew said that he had set up a meeting um, to talk with Stuart and the state coalition this week to get us an answer on that question of, does it have to come out of admin or, or could it be something built into projects? Okay, and, and my last thing there. Okay, and my last thing has to do with the um, the video production, I'm in favor of doing it, but I think you still have the issue of the city procurement rules. Uh, you have to submit a number of other, you know, you can't just say we've got this one. You, when I talked to procurement, their answer was that um, it's best practice, um, but it's best practice to secure or attempt to secure three bids. And I attempted, mm -hmm. and the answer that I got from a number of folks was, I'm not interested or there's no way I could do it for that amount of money. It's a wor not worth your time for me to, it's not worth my time to put together a proposal that well, you as long done. As long as you have that on paper, then that's your, your effort. And as long as that's, that documentation is there on paper, then I think we're all right. I mean, so if it's under $10,000, right, you don't actually have to follow legally right like there's no no bidding piece that's required right that requires three bids um it's just best practice under ten thousand. okay yes michael madam chairman you, you're still going to go through the purchasing department is that correct mm -hmm. okay so they're, they're the actually it's their job to find the vendors not really your job it's that's their true. jobs um, so I don't want a, a contract to yeah. be challenged uh, because we didn't follow the proper procedure. That this That's ought true. to be going through the purchasing agent exclusively, uh, not right. us. So, so we can put the, you know, I can take the proposal, I can send it to, you know, procurement and yes. they would, you know, solicit bids. And if anyone let, came in lower, we would look at it. Let them decide. Uh, Mar uh, Megan, we're not we're not the purchasing agents. Uh, we don't have the authority to do that. 
The purchasing well, agent I, is- I would want some authority to, to, well, to know you, who you we're make a hiring. Megan, I, I, I don't want to burst your bubble. You may get challenged if your contract gets awarded and you didn't, and the purchasing agent didn't follow up on it. You may get challenged on that. We're My not understanding is that's agent. only true for over $10,000. Well, I think it's be, well, I think you're playing with fire. We have a purchasing agent with a purchasing department. That's I mean, I'll, I'll do whatever procurement tells me I need to do. I certainly wouldn't go outside of whatever their guidance is. For sure. I think you're playing with fire. Well, well I anyway. would. My point is, I would talk to procurement, and if they tell me that's what has to happen, then that's what has to happen. I wouldn't do something. We'll get it in other writing. Megan, get it in writing. They, they authorize you to do it. Get it in writing. Nothing verbal. Keep okay. everything in writing to cover yourself. Yeah, I can do that. Mary? Do you need a motion? Do you need a motion? I do. Yeah. All right. I move to um, authorize Megan to continue to investigate the. Uh, contracting of a video um, producer to develop um, advertising or uh, to, for the concert for the uh, uh, CPAC. I think I would need an up to a certain amount. Oh, so do I add on to that up to uh, up to what up to $6,000? What is the what is the amount? So the proposal we have right five, now okay, is up to five thousand four thousand eight hundred and fifty. Okay, up to five thousand dollars. I'll second that. That was, like, that was going to be my point. I raised my hand is to put some sort of a dollar amount because I think she's done the investigating enough. We want to authorize her to actually go ahead through uh, through purchasing. And uh, and uh, kind of initiate getting this started because she's done all the investigation at the, you know, at the end of the, the, this already. Michael, Madam Chairman, as a point of discussion, I would like to add, if memory would allow, and John would allow, uh, as the sponsors of this, if we have the money in the budget to do it, yes. If we don't have the money in the budget, or if we have to borrow into next year, or if it cuts so close to the to our, to our bottom line at the end of the year, we hold off. If we have available funds um, and it's wise business decision that we have some left over the next year, I'm for it, but I'm, we're taking money out of admin. Uh, I just hope we, have, we don't take too much out. That's all. Yes, and we can't overspend admin. It's impossible. Okay. For sure. Okay, is there any other um, points of discussion? In favor or concerns? Okay. All right, let's move to a vote. Um, all in favor? Yeah, I... Aye. Aye. Right. Um, that was the last piece on the agenda that I had. Is there anything else before we depart? What is our next meeting date, Madam Chairman? So we have the public meeting on the 27th at six o'clock. And then we will have tentatively a meeting on Wednesday the 9th. And if that changes, then we would um, briefly discuss that at the end of the public meeting on the 27th. Okay. I will say I'm really pumped Public meeting is my favorite part of the year. Everyone gets to present to us. We get to get excited about what projects we get to fund. Mm -hmm. Just saying, don't forget people. We're lucky. This stuff is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, is nice there a, no, I make a motion to adjourn. Ooh. Yes. Second. All right, folks. I'll see you on the 27th. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Good night, everyone. Bye now. Good night.